you to come sit there. I'm not going to join you at the table just because. Okay. <laughs> just decided we just thought it's better to keep things more horizontal. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so that's the plan. So I'll invite you once I finish my introduction and various things and all those administrative things. And, okay. Um, but you're up here. And then you can sit down there while she makes her comments and then just invite you both to join. <laughs> Stuff in conversation, and you can respond to anything you want from her comment. You can handle it. You can, you can do what you want. And then I'm going to let you field questions. Like you can yes. choose your yes. Okay. I'll just yeah. I'll just yeah. handle the field. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I mean, yes. you know most of these people as well as I do, so I don't think that way. Yeah. They, I don't, you know, so a lot of them are friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not too many mind things. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Okay, is this on? Is this on? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I love the lively conversation. I don't want to stop it. Okay. Okay, okay. We're actually going to get started. Um, much as I'm hesitant to... Um, Silence, an evidently lively conversation. We should probably get going um, after getting into the room a little bit late. Um, uh, first, good evening. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm really uh, excited to see so many people here. It's fantastic. Um, uh, I'm Felicity Scott, and I'm just going to introduce the event, which is the actually the ninth annual Detlef Mountains Lecture. Uh, and this series is hosted in memory of Detlef's life and, and scholarly work, and to celebrate his commitment to com uh, coupling academic rigor uh, with an ethics of disciplinary transformation, um, launched in collaboration with Keller Easterling, who's joining us. Uh, in the spring of 2015, the Mountains Lecture draws upon Detlef's um, ambition to advance a concept of, and I quote, a modernity that takes difference or alterity to be its core. And so the series is conceived as an invitation to emerging scholars whose work helps unsettle disciplinary norms and to open architectural histories onto many forms of alterity, scholars who we believe are advancing critical and innovative approaches. So introducing his collection uh, of essays, Modernity Unbound, Detlef recalled, and I quote again, I came to focus on things that had been misunderstood or overlooked in the historical record and could therefore serve as mediators for new thought and design. And so it's this ethic of, of openness to a future, uh, this understanding that architectural history is not a practice of codifying norms or cultural codes, uh, that the series has been founded uh, and continuing to support. Um, so supporting work that reframes and reclaims elements of architecture's complicated relationships to modernity, uh, research also seeking to reinflect architecture's historical record. And the Merton's lecture, I should say, like quickly, um, became a really important event in the GSEP calendar, uh, supporting scholarly conversations both in the school uh, and also, I think, across a much wider community of architectural historians. And uh, many people I know have been watching the podcast, which I think is incredible. So tonight, I'm really, really happy to be welcoming Diana Martinez, who's sitting here. Diana is Assistant Professor and Director of Architectural Studies at Tufts University, where she's taught since 2017. Uh, and where she's opened up significant new dimensions in the department's curriculum. Uh, but however, she's been invited to give tonight's lecture for her important and I believe groundbreaking research in the context of the Philippines, a body of work that not only expands the literature on the archipelago, but profoundly reconfigures the discipline's approach to histories and geographies of American architecture and urbanism. Diana received her PhD from Columbia in 2016 with a dissertation entitled uh, Concrete Colonialism, Architecture, Infrastructure, Urbanism, and the American Colonization of the Philippines. Uh, and I'll come back to that now, about to be here in the book form. And while I don't want to give too much away, I, I do want to note that the, the concrete in the title can at once be taken quite literally as, as a material, 
while also serving as the occasion to read the reconstruction of physical environments uh, at many scales as being tied to the racialized economic and geopolitical ambitions of colonial governance and the aesthetic and technical dimensions of coloniality in the early 20th century. Uh, so Dinah has reworked this as a book, uh, and I'm very excited um, that Concrete Colonialism, now subtitled Architecture, Urbanism, Racial Capitalism, and the American Colonial Project in the Philippines, 1898 to 1945, will soon appear on Duke University Press. Am I right? Yeah? Yeah? Duke. Um, and so we're very lucky to have a preview of parts of this research tonight, uh, a preview heralding what I believe will be a very important book. Uh, just to cite a couple of other things, I'm not going to... Um, that Diana's recently published. Uh, these include a very important chapter uh, titled From Rice Research to Coconut Capital uh, in the 2022 volume published by Aggregate called Architecture in Development, Systems and the Emergence of the Global South. Also a great article called Concrete Urbanism um, just uh, appeared like two couple of years ago in Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And her work has also appeared in GSEP's own Avery Review, uh, including a great article from the same year, from 2020, called An Archipelago of Interiors, the Philippine Supermall as Infrastructure of Diaspora. So we're also very lucky that following uh, Diana's lecture, S.C. Eistera will offer a response uh, and open up the conversation. Um, a little bit more briefly, SE is, current, is currently assistant professor for architectural history and theory at the School of Architecture at Princeton University, having earlier taught uh, at UPenn and Boston University. In 2020, she presented a wonderful mountains lecture derived from her forthcoming book called Memories of the Resistance, Margareta Shudelahotsky and the Architecture of Collective Dissidents from 1918 to 1989. And she also has an edited volume called Living Room, Architecture, Gender, and Theory, forthcoming, uh, which, as she explains, illuminates methods and theories in writing about feminist and LGBTQIA plus spaces in architecture. She's a wide-ranging collaborator and a dedicated scholar whose work traverses fields from histories of housing and cooperative movements to queer theory and environmentalism. Uh, and I'm very happy that you agreed um, to open up this dialogue with Diana. And just before turning the podium over to Diana, I want to uh, sincerely thank Elise Jaffe and Jeffrey Brown for endowing this lecture series in 2020 after actually supporting it for a number of years. And I also want to thank Dean Andres Hake um, and my fellow Mountains Lecture Committee members, Mabel Wilson, Athea Karikawala, Zenab Chelik Alexander, and S.C. Eistra, uh, for a conversation that really took stock of the field and its manifold potentials in making this decision. Finally, many thanks due to uh, Stefan Bodica and Lucy Krebsbach for their untiring help in making this and, and many other events at GSUP um, possible. So, tonight's lecture entitled Architecture in Triple Person. Um, please join me in welcoming Diana to the podium. <laughs> Thank you so much, Felicity, for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, I just want to uh, start out by thanking Keller for creating this opportunity in honor of Detlef Mertens and his pathbreaking work. Though I will not be presenting um, my work um, through the lens of concrete tonight, his, his writing and reflections on the enmeshed technological and symbolic dimensions of material have been um, essential in helping me develop my own approach to my own objects of inquiry. I also want to thank the committee, Felicity, S. Essie, Atia, and Mabel for giving me the opportunity to present this work to you this evening. And of course, to, uh, to Shannon and Lucille, um, and for the AV team for all of their organizational labor. <clears throat> I actually don't know how I'm supposed to advance the slides. <laughs> Is there a remote? Oh, do I just press this? Okay, I think I, I, think I just press this. Okay, um, let me just check. Is there the AV guy? <laughs> oh, oh, is this? Oh, okay. Sorry, I got. I have it. I have it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. The lights. <clears throat> okay. Yes. So. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm just gonna realize I have to get a laser pointer. Um, So um, though what I'm presenting tonight uh, might be thought of 
as a part of a Philippine national history. It can only be presented that way because it was written into history as such, to be filed and siloed away as relevant only to Philippine national subjects. Therefore, what I aim to carefully retrace tonight is the path of the scalpel used to carefully excise this story from an important chapter in US history, a chapter that itself unfolds within the context of an interwar internationalism in which the United States is jockeying for a hegemonic position. This is a history of the Philippines only in as much as it is rendered as such by the colonizer and by its well-trained native elite. What has been historically presented as a national reawakening will be presented here as a neo-colonial strategy when focused around the thematization of the native body. Though my lecture draws broadly upon Franz Fanon's two major works, The Wretched of the Earth and Black Skin, White Masks, the title of my lecture refers to a specific pa passage in Black Skin and White Masks in which Fanon describes an event where he suddenly becomes aware of his body in triple person, a realization that he was simultaneously responsible not only for his body, but for his race and for his ancestors. In The Wretched of the Earth, Fanon comes to the conclusion that it is necessary to assent to all violence committed on behalf of decolonizing forces. Violence, he argued, is an inherent part of the decolonization process. Fanon wrote this, not, um, wrote not only of his experience in Martinique and Algeria, but of decolonization as a general process. One of the reasons why I'm interested in Fanon's work is because it allows me to compare what at least appears to be two very different processes of decolonization. On the right, we see the arrest of Ahmed Ben Bella and other leaders of the FLN by the French army. This is an image that rep represents what Fanon might describe as part of a normal process of decolonization, one that must take shape in opposition to assumed to be former colonial power. In the Philippines, the process of decolonization takes shape not in opposition to US empire, but as an ascent to its seemingly ineluctable rise. The perverse results of this politics of recognition is illustrated here by the official celebration of US occupation. Of course, the whole story is not a monolithic one, and I don't, I don't want to present it as such. Anti-colonial violence and a rejection of US imperial power was never fully extinguished in the Philippines, but the story of native resistance is not my focus tonight. The story I tell today is one of the US as a colonizer. <clears throat> My talk tonight focuses on the conception, design, construction, and influence of a single building. The photo on the right was taken close to the time of the building's completion in July of 1926. Just a few weeks before its inauguration, Leonard Wood, then serving as the Governor General of the Philippines, arrived to the building site to conduct a final inspection. Upon reading the building's dedication, freshly inscribed into the attic's central panel, Wood immediately ordered its removal. It had once read, erected by the Filipino people as monument to rights won and dedicated by them to the cause of freedom. Wood explained to the Philippine legislature that there were two reasons for this order. The first was supposedly grammatical. Wood argued that the article A was necessary before the word monument. The second reason was that the inscription had been unauthorized. I love this photo on the left because it captures, in, it captures in the glazed expressions of the Philippine senators their absolute disgust and exasperation with Leonard Wood. In any event, the grammatical correction was both trifling and incorrect. The elimination of punctuations or indefinite articles was a convention of monumental inscriptions. Far from careless, the inscription was in fact a study in the kind of careful wordsmithing born out of a complex politics of recognition. For example, the inscription made no specific reference to independence, only to rights won. Likewise, there was no legal claim to freedom, only a stated belief in the cause of freedom. In other words, the inscription was not an appeal to an imperial sovereign. Rather, it was an appeal to the universal values that the United States claimed to represent. But did the erasure of the inscription change the meaning of the building? And why would a colonial power allow such a building to be built? designed as a monument to a rejection of colonial sovereignty. Why would it allow this to be built in the first place? To begin to answer these questions <clears throat> requires some background. Since the beginning of the US colonial period in the Philippines, in general, Republicans favored colonial retention, while Democrats supported Philippine national so sovereignty. When Woodrow Wilson became the first Democrat to hold the office of the president since 1893, he moved to fulfill a campaign promise to grant independence to the Philippines. He did this by signing the Jones Act into law in August of 1916. 
the law contained the first formal commitment to grant the Philippines its national sovereignty. The promise was, however, conditional, and it contained no timeline for withdrawal. Nevertheless, the Jones Law pro did provide a framework for a transition, including a provision for the creation of the first fully elected Philippine legislature, a bicameral legislature that since 1907 consisted of a Philippine lower house made up of an elected body of colonial subjects and an upper house at first made up um, exclusively of American appointees. <clears throat> Elections for an all-Filipino upper house were held just two months after the passage of the Jones Law. This marked the symbolic beginning of a process referred to as Filipinization, the purpose of which was to rapidly replace all American civil servants in the Philippines with American-trained Filipinos, at the end of which it was presumed the United States would grant the Philippines its independence. Before I proceed, an important note. All members of the upper and lower house belonged to a single political party, the Partido Nacionalista which was first organized as a vehicle for Philippine independence. I will henceforth simply refer to, the, to members of the party as nacionalistas. Following the passage of the Jones Law, the colonial government under Wilson worked steadily towards Filipinization. Uncertainty, however, loomed on the horizon in the form of the 1920 presidential election. Would Republicans recant on Wilson's promise to grant the Philippines its independence? In 1920, as nacionalistas had feared, Republicans retook the executive office. Even worse, the president-elect was Warren G. Harding, the former chair of the Senate Committee on the Philippines and a hardline retentionist. As you can see, however, by the time that Harding was inaugurated, the number of Americans serving in the Philippine insular government had drastically dwindled. Whatever Harding's desires were, nacionalistas had carefully prepared for the likely election of a Republican president. The centerpiece of their preparations was the construction of a legislative building. Currently, the Philippine legislature met in the Intendencia, the old seat of Spanish colonial governance, which is actually just pictured in the middle of this image here. <clears throat> Simply occupying the Intendencia was viewed by nation nacionalistas as an insufficiently powerful symbol. National independence had to take on the appearance of an organic and creative act. Planning began with the selection of a site, um, which was right here. <clears throat> According to Burnham's original plan, the site was originally intended for the National Library. And I just want to walk you through the main elements of the plan. This is the old walled city here um, in Tromuros. Um, this was where the location of the Intendencia. Um, this was to be um, the original location of the legislative building with the executive office in the center and um, the two houses on either side. This was to be a series of executive um, bureaus and um, uh, surrounding um, uh, the old city was to be um, a series of cultural institutions and, um, and municipal institutions. The city hall is there. And then these were supportive offices and actually unique um, uh, to Burnham's uh, master plans was an entire wing uh, dedicated to the judicial branch of the government. <clears throat> So a design for the library had actually already been developed by Ralph Harrington Doan, the last American consulting architect to serve in the Philippines. Indeed, this is why the site was chosen. With only four years before the presidential elections, there wasn't enough time to develop, to develop brand new plans for the legislative building, let alone to begin construction. Thus, Nacionalistas decided to convert the library into the new home of the Philippine legislature. By the time of Harding's inauguration, the legislative building's foundation piles had already been driven into the ground. The optical strategy was obvious. The massive building would be too conspicuous a project to halt without stirring controversy. It would present to the world that Philippine self-determination was not only possible, but already extant. Conversely, it would make the American insular regime appear redundant, outdated, and unwelcome. But how would Indeed, how could such a building be presented as an argument for Philippine national sovereignty when it so clearly followed the patterns of a US colonial regime that was still very much in power and designed as it was in the very image of monumental Washington? This absurdity was built into the US colonial project from the very beginning. Um, US officials had difficulty reconciling the annexation of the Philippines with its historical identification as a, democ as a democratic revolutionary republic. The Democrats and their nacionalista collaborators, however, viewed um, this building not as a monument to national sovereignty as such, 
but as a monument to the process of Filipinization. The architect's charge then was not to express a will to Philippine nationhood, but to toe the line between a desire for sovereignty and a gratefulness to a magnanimous imperial power. The, de de the defining difference between the Filipinized architecture and the colonial architecture that preceded it can be reduced to the fact that it was designed, built, and occupied by Filipino bodies. Perhaps no one articulated the significance and nature of Filipinization as precisely as Carmi Thompson, who was then acting as President Calvin Coolidge's surrogate in the Philippines. In a speech on the day of the building's inauguration, Carmi announced, and I quote, <clears throat> You have this day consecrated a new home for your deliberations, and your friends across the sea will point with pride to this structure as an index of your material progress. Indeed, the pro-independence lobby in Washington, D.C. would refer to the leg legislative building as having been designed by Filipino brains and built by Filipino hands. Though the legislative building was presented as a convincing argument for national sovereignty, it also marked the thematization of the native body. Thompson's, Thompson's emphasis on Filipino brains and hands presented the building not as an architectural accomplishment in itself, but as an extension of the body of the native architect. The body in question belonged to the architect Juan Aureliano, who designed the building in his capacity as the first Filipino co-supervisor of the architectural division of the Bureau of Public Works. His co-supervisor was Tomas Bautista Mapua, um, both had already worked for the insular government under their American predecessors. <clears throat> both Mapua and Aureliano had received at least part of their education in the U.S. Mapua graduated from Cornell in 1908 as one of the first products of the Pensionados program, which arranged for participating American universities to waive tuition while the U.S. government paid for travel and living expenses. Upon the completion of their studies, Pensionados were required to, to serve at least 18 months of government service. Aureliano took a less direct path towards the Bureau of Public Works. Born into a cosmopolitan family of Filipino elites, Juan was, a, was first exposed to the architectural profession through the work of his father, Luis C. Aureliano, an accomplished master builder and assistant to the Catalan architect, Juan Josep Hervas y Erismendi, who worked as Manila's municipal architect from 1887 to 1893. Following Aureliano's father's sudden death, Aureliano, then just 13 years old, quit school, taking a job drafting for the Bureau of Lands. After work hours, he studied painting under one of the Philippines' most acclaimed artists, Lorenzo Guerrero. In 1903, at the age of 16, Aureliano sent a painting, Women Descending a Staircase, to St. To Louis, where it was placed on display amongst the work of other Filipino artists at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. In terms of visitor numbers and revenues earned, the Philippines exhibit at the St. Louis Exposition was the most popular exhibit. It was not, however, artistic accomplishments like those of Aureliano's that were the main attraction. Rather, it was Filipinos themselves. More than 1,200 Filipinos arrived to St. Louis in connection with the massive Philippine reservation, an exhibit intended to introduce the American public to their new colonial possession. The symbolism of the reservation's plan was clear, and here um, just I've outlined in red where the Philippine reservation was. The Philippines lay outside of, um, uh, of this main area, which was called the main picture. And um, as you can see, the fair's neoclassical architecture, which was visible from most points within the, Philippine, within the Philippine reservation, served as a sort of civilizational backdrop for the reservation's quote unquote primitive architecture, which we'll see in the next slide. Within the reservation, settlements and, and homes of the archipelago's varied inhabitants, built out of materials imported from the Philippines and constructed by the displayed peoples themselves, were arranged along a circuit leading the viewer past, quote, several stages of Filipino development. Four villages placed in a ring surrounding the central plaza represented Igorot, Negrito, Visayan, and Moro groups. On the outskirts of the exposition was the camp of the Philippine Constabulary, responsible for policing um, the Filipinos on display. At the center was Plaza Santo Tomas, representing the most civilized aspects of Philippine society. In completing their journey through the exposition, the fairgoer would have experienced evolution as a temporally compressed spectacle. <clears throat> 
Five years after the St. Louis Exposition, Arellano made another appearance at another exposition, though this time not as an artist represented by his work, but as a colonial subject placed on display. Though little is known about Arellano's time at Jamestown, it is almost certain that he came not as an example of a savage, but as an example of a civilized native. I can say this, um, though we don't know for sure, with a fair amount of confidence because organizers of the Philippine Exposition at Jamestown agreed to make amends with Filipino elites who considered St. Louis a fiasco. Drawing a revealing analogy, one angered nacionalista, Vincente Nepomuceno, argued, <clears throat> The Moros, the, the Negritos, and Igorotes no more represent the Filipinos than the dying Indian represents the people of the United States. As a result, fair organizers agreed to exclude Igorotes and Negritos, but insisted on the inclusion of the Muslim Moros, an exception I will return to shortly. Thus, Aureliano's cohort of Hispanized and Christianized Filipinos presented their own developed bodies as proof of civilization and in the absence of members of its own dying races of savage minorities. Philippine racism towards its own internal others was not a new phenomenon. In their pursuit of political rights during the Spanish colonial era, elite Filipinos put themselves up as examples of Philippine society at large by demonstrating their civilization through their education, sartorial sophistication, artistic achievement, athleticism, eloquence in Spanish, and loyalty to Spain. The problem with this glancing attack on Spanish imperial racism was that it predicated political rights on sociocultural features deemed as civilized ultimately delimiting the boundaries of who could be recognized as representative of the nation. This distinction is further objectified during the US colonial occupation, as we can see here in the 1903 Philippine census, which draws a very hard line between the archipelago's civilized and wild populations. <clears throat> Whatever the case, Jamestown for Arellano was an indignity he was willing to endure the price he paid for a ticket to the United States where he intended to study architecture. His eventual destination was Philadelphia, where he took a job at the Philadelphia Commercial Museum as a photocolorist to support himself while he, while he pursued his architectural studies at Drexel Institute. When Arellano returned to the Philippines in 1916, he took a job at the Bureau of Public Works, eventually taking control of the architectural division of the Bureau. It bears reminding that when he took this job, it was only a decade after he placed himself on display at Jamestown. That is to say, by the time that Arellano began his job at the Bureau of Public Works, he had experienced, on an extraordinary and intimate level, the burdens of serving as a model for the nation, or in Fanon's words, the burdens of triple personhood. This was a burden he felt acutely on July 16, 1926, the day he celebrated the inauguration of his largest and most important commission to date, the Philippine Legislative Building. A few months after the inauguration of the Legislative Building, pro-independence lobbyists invited Arellano back to the United States. This time, he was accompanied by his wife, the singer Natividad Ocampo de Arellano, who assisted him in championing the nacionalista cause. Working as a sort of conjugal team, Natividad sang in concerts, while Juan's paintings, sketches, and architectural renderings were exhibited at the house office building. Catching wind of these events, the New York Times ran a short article about Aureliano titled, quote, noted architect once posed as wild man at Jamestown. The piece detailed the seemingly miraculous transformation of Aureliano, who, 20 years after, and this is a quote, 20 years after he first landed in the United States from steerage as a brown-skinned wild man, would return to the United States as a sort of valedictory homecoming. In the article, Aureliano's accomplishments, his graduation from an American university, the prizes that he won, his general command of ancient classic lines, dramatized his fictionalized metamorphosis from a wild man into a cultured individual. Far from presenting Aureliano's accomplishments as his own, the article instead served to confirm the success and progressive nature of the American colonial project. At the precise moment that the United States wished to frame its withdrawal from the Philippines, not as the admission of a historical error, but as evidence of a civilizing mission accomplished. Though his reaction to the Times article is unknown, it is difficult to imagine that Aureliano would have been pleased with either posing as a wild man or being called a wild man, even if in the past tense. 
What is certain is that Arellano understood the peculiar constraints of his position. Though narratives of American development of, of the Filipinos served Americans best, it also advanced the cause of an elite-driven independence movement, for which Arellano served as a highly symbolic advocate. That is to say, Arellano understood the strategic value of presenting his own success, even his own body, as an accomplishment of his colonizers. But now let us turn to what Arellano actually designed. As I mentioned earlier, Arellano did not uh, design the building from scratch. The legislative building was a redesign of the National Library um, by his American professor, uh, predecessor, Ralph Harrington Doan. <clears throat> Arellano's most obvious modification was to the building's portico. Doan's original design consisted of a simple projection topped by a pediment adorned with a modest shield at its center. Aureliano replaced Stone's simpler portico with an elaborate version that borrowed from the conventions of the Triumphal Arch. His most direct precedent was very clearly the Trevi Fountain, which Aureliano would have seen during his travels through Europe. As a, as a classical type wholly dedicated to communication, the Triumphal Arch incorporates redundant structural components that support a superimposed semantic structure. Though Aureliano's portico is not an arch, the columns do perform redundant duties, bearing both the actual and symbolic weight of the four figures positioned above the capitals, who represent what Filipinologists then considered the four sources of Philippine culture, Chinese, Hindu, Spanish, and Anglo-Saxon. Above the attic, two figures re representing the arts and sciences fl flank a globe on which a Philippine eagle perches. Notes to the triumphal, uh, nods to the triumphal arch take the form of two exedra, each of which house um, a sculpture, the first entitled home and the second entitled progress. Collectively, these bodies represent a national body, but what did these bodies look like and on what model were they built? Um, the answer is far from straightforward. Starting around at least the late 19th century, the canon itself was increasingly challenged by the emerging fields of anthropology and ethnology, as seen, for example, in the racialized structural rationalism of Viollet le Duc. For le Duc, the source of style and structure was not universal, but climatically particular, an ideal encapsulated by le, Duc's by le Duc's concluding exhortation in the habitation of man of all ages to know thyself. To know oneself in this case was not a manner was not a matter of introspection, but to familiarize oneself with one's own body as an ethnological object, as an environmentally or nationally contingent object. But, as anthropologists and practicing in the Philippines knew, the one-to-one -one relationship between the habitat and the inhabitant was not as clear a diagram as Le Duc presented it to be. And this internal heterogeneity posed a problem to the emerging modern conception of the nation. One of the most important founders of the modern nation state was Woodrow Wilson, who as a, as a history professor at Princeton, once presented Philippine heterogeneity as a condition that disqualified a Filipino claim to national sovereignty. In Woodrow Wilson's words, <clears throat> no people can form a community or be subjected to common forms of government who are as diverse and, ha and as heterogeneous as a people of the Philippine Islands. They are of many races, of many stages of development, having nothing in common except that they lived for many hundreds of years under a government which arrested their development. And of course, he's referring to the Spanish. As president, and more to the point, as a president who ultimately promised the Philippines its independence, Wilson had to resolve his early diagnosis of an arrested Philippine development with a campaign promise um, to leave the Philippines. Wilson's answer to this contradiction was a transitional process of development. Though today we mostly associate development with the post-war era and understand it in mostly economic terms, as I argue in more detail in my book, race was the first object of, de of development practice, the tools of which were education and environmental modification in the form of landscape, architecture, and public works projects. As suggested by the image above, education and environmental design could be marshaled towards racial development to act directly on race itself. A second nature enriched by U.S. industrial progress would act as an accelerator, as an accelerator of evolutionary time. This developmental framework enabled the U.S. to propose forms of intervention that did not require formal colonial sovereignty. Now we may turn to the legislative building, um, which plays a special role vis-a-vis -vis race development, not as an environmental agent, but as, a, but as a symbolic projection of its ideal end. To answer what Wilson identified as a problematic heterogeneity, Aureliano presented a future racial unity. This aim um, of a future racial unity is most clearly articulated in the building's two identical pediments. Here, the Filipino national body is depicted not as one, but as three figures, representing the archipelago's three principal island groups, 
The female figure at the center represents Luzon. To her right sits a male figure that represents Mindanao. And to her left is a female figure representing the Visayas. Luzon's scepter and elevated position identify her as a sovereign. Luzon's regal stoicism is juxtaposed with the defiant expression of Mindanao. Visayas, meanwhile, casts her gaze downwards in a fully deferential posture. Mindanao and the Visayas face away from each other, illustrating a mythologized conflict between them. Historically, both the Spanish and American colonial regimes regarded the Visayans as the victims of centuries of Moro violence. This perception was shaped by the successful Christianization of the Visayans and the largely unsuccessful attempts to colonize and Christianize the Moros. Placing Luzon in the center positioned the lowland Filipinos of Luzon as the only power fit to protect both the effete and feminized Visayans and to exert control over the masculinized and martial culture of Mindanao. Here, national stability required that the Christianized Tagalog from Luzon mediate between the Moro threat and Visayan subservience. Depicting subservience as negative was actually new. Under both US and Spanish colonial regimes, obedience was a highly regarded character trait. In the context of national sovereignty, however, Visayan submissiveness was viewed as a threat to stability equally as problematic as Moro aggression. Luzon is here presented as a power responsible for, ma for managing this internecine tribal conflict. This allegory served the purposes of a self-identifying native elite dominated by Tagalogs from Luzon, a group that was both reliably amenable to American political and economic goals and protective of their own claims to power. Luzon, Mindanao, and the, and the Visayas do not sit alone, but are flanked by personifications of learning, law, commerce, and agriculture from left to right. They, they recline in casual repose, somewhat indifferent to the national trio. It is the national trio that must attend to these figures. The defined Mindanao must heed the lesson of law and learning, and Visayas, draped in a fine cloth of native fiber for which the region is known, must follow the lead of commerce and agriculture. The nation, in other words, must orient itself towards these universal values, depicted here as figures racially distinct from the national figures. Perhaps unique to national personifications is that attributes include not only signifying objects, but more importantly, costume and ethnographic features. Luzon wears a barotzaya, a 19th century Hispanized version of pre-colonial dress. Noticeably, Luzon's dress is not as fine as that worn at, by the Visayas, a nod to the aforementioned weaving skills of the Visayan women. Mindanao, to Luzon's right, is depicted as a male warrior. He wears a, a form-fitting shirt and holds a kris, the um, traditional weapon of the Moros. His sarong and headdress indicate both his geographical origins and his Muslim faith. The native dress of Arleano's nat uh, national trio differs from both the politicized sartorial choices of the 19th century illustrados, from, um, which means um, the, the native elite and illustrados translates uh, literally to um, enlightened ones, and from the dress of the so-called wild or savage um, tribes shown in the bottom row. These images are pulled from a major feature in National Geographic. Images of these, groups, uh, of these groups that we see in the bottom row appear nowhere in the building. The dress of the national trio splits the difference between these two poles, presenting distinctive though civilized character-giving forms of national expression. Working out uh, which groups were fit for, a leading, for leading a nation was a task worked out self-consciously in the context of Wilsonian internationalism. This was an order sorted out on a global map of nested hierarchies, one in which the Anglo-Saxon assumed a position at the top, while other dominant ethnic groups ordained as relatively more civilized assumed sovereignty over their own national subalterns. This was, in short, a global systematization of techniques of racial, man racial management. Thus, though Wilson is celebrated, even today, as a hero of Philippine independence, his advocacy should not be viewed as a cause he championed on account of a belief in racial equality. It was, to the contrary, a means of instantiating race as the basis of a new world order. Within this system, claiming authorship over the idealized native body or the self was a prerequisite for national self-determination. Unlike the native costume which presents the three figures as culturally distinct, the ethnographic features of the trio were intended to unite them. This is important because for Wilson and others, racial unity was the legitimizing basis of the modern nation state. Um, just a quick warning, the next slide contains images of human remains. In order to flesh out this racial unity, Aureliano and his collaborators turned to ethnological and anthropological descriptions of the typical Filipino. It is likely that they used the work of Henry Otley Beyer, who is uh, today still referred to as the Dean of Philippine Anthropology. 
Bayer describes the typical Filipino as a uniform melee type, possessing a medium stature, excellent muscular development, broad shoulders, slender waist, small hands and feet, brown complexion, straight black hair with virtually no beard or mustache, and black or brown eyes set rather slanting under an intelligent brow. Like many others, Bayer viewed the Moros, the majority population in Mindanao, in his words, as not savages, but barbarians. Undoubtedly of the same racial stock as the Christianized and civilized Filipino, though occupying a much lower cultural level. The inclusion of the Moro of Mindanao as part of the national trio demonstrates that it was race and not culture that, determines, that determined one's eventual el eligibility for Philippine citizenship. What we are looking at here is the acceptance of racial diversity only within the circumscribed limits of a hypostatized difference. Such were the mixed terms of, legitim of legitimizing the power of the nation within a barely diminished Western imperial scaffold, a scaffold frankly re represented here by the neoclassical pediment that encloses the entirety of this racialized composition, a striking illustration of Fanon's triple person schema, one in which Aureliano is made responsible not only for his body, but for the body of his Tagalog ancestors and for his race, but for fabricating an objectified image of it. Aureliano, however, was not directly responsible for modeling the figures of the pediment. Beyond sketches and a few directives, Aureliano left the execution of all his sculptural groups to a set of collaborators. He was not, Aureliano was not confident that native talent could execute the unprecedented scale of the building's pediment. In order to ensure its successful completion, Aureliano hired a German sculptor, a man by the name of Otto Fischer Credo, to both execute the sculptures and to train native Filipino assistants. Fischer Credo was a recent graduate of the École des Beaux-Arts and had previously attended Berlin's Académie der Kunst. Though classically trained uh, when Fischer Credo came to the Philippines, he was immediately charged with assimilating the anthropological challenge to the, to the classical tradition. This surplus of ethnological information available to Fischer Credo did not seem to help him very much. There is a distinct awkwardness to Fischer Credo's Filipino figures. Luzon is more chair than body, a scaffold for native costume. Her stiffness is echoed by, by Mindanao's strange proportions and flattened block-like head. Visayas is the most elegant of the three, but even her posture seems uneasy when compared to the classical figures that flank the Philippine trio. It is not, it is not only the modeling of, the, of these figures that is awkward, so is Aureliano's composition. The national trio is separated from the classical figures by pedestals that serve no allegorical function except to create space between the figures. This distance illustrates that the, that the reconciliation of the post-colonial post nation's inner racial principle with the classical ideal would not be misinterpreted as a sort of physical intimacy, even if merely symbolic. Today, Fisher Credo is an obscure figure, a legacy that in the Philippines is intentionally shrouded by the compulsion to attribute Filipino art and architecture to Filipino brains and hands. More often than not, his apprentice, Ramon Martinez, is credited as the author of his pediment sculptures. Despite this, Fisher Credo's imprint on the Philippines was lasting. Conversely, his work in the Philippines deeply influenced the direction of his own career, as constructing personifications of the nation through a representation of race would become for him both a specialty and lifelong pursuit. Fittingly, in 1938, Fisher Credo, then living and working in New York, caught wind of new opportunities for artists in his homeland. Back in Germany, he joined legions of German artists whose practice would be defined by the consolidation of race with nation. As an, as an official sculptor for the Third Reich, both Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler sat for him. This is, um, uh, this is a bust of Hitler that was actually sold in 2006. And the other image is of an Asia Asiatic head, um, which was recently um, deaccessioned um, at uh, UBC in Vancouver. However striking, this is not a story that can be reduced to what may seem an astonishing coincidence. Importantly, it reverses what has long been a perception that particularly dangerous strains of post-colonial nationalisms were inspired or followed the emergence of post-World War I European nationalisms. What the story of Fisher Credo reveals is the global emergence of modern, of modern ethno-nationalisms. For the purposes of architectural history, the historical currents that shape the biographies of, of Aureliano and Fisher Credo, Fisher Credo offered, offer us a new clue on how to reassess histories of both the architecture of the nation and internationalism. 
On the left, we have the native's demonstration of a mastery of a Western classical idiom populated by native figures. And on the right, we have a classicism starved of character and uh, starved of character and down, endowing ornament. This lack of specificity was part of an attempt to, to deracinate a Western claim to civilizational origins. We should understand the proliferation of bodies on the left and the stripping of ornament on the right as a single architecture headed in opposite directions. In the post-war period, Aureliano's ornamental bodies reappear in the work of other Filipino architects as a nativism realized in tectonic form. Internationalism, meanwhile, is represented at, as represented as an expression of pure structure, the formalization of a universalizing technological progress. Despite the common origin of these architectures, they are presented as not only formal, but ideological opposites, when they are, in fact, strictly speaking, organs of the same organization. Let us now swerve back to the legislative building, which I compare here with the US Capitol building and with Edward Lovett Pierce's Irish House of Parliament, which I'm sure you didn't expect to see. Include, it's included here because Pierce's design was the first legislative building to include two separate chambers for a bicameral legislature. In Purse's parliament building, the lower house holds pride of place, while the upper house, um, occupied mostly by Anglo-Norman lords, loyal to the English crown, distorts the classical body. Compare this to Thornton's plan for the US Capitol building, which maintains an outward semblance of symmetry while distorting the Palladian diagram to accommodate a dynamic balance of power. In Aureliano's legislative building, we see the return of a perfect symmetry. Um, though bilateral symmetry is, of course, typical of Beaux-Arts plans, it is, of course, it is of particular significance here. Aureliano achieves this symmetry by placing the upper house on top of the lower house. Aureliano's motivation to return a perfect symmetry to the plan was not merely architectural, but reflected a new hierarchy introduced to assuage fears of the unpredictable and unruly powers of the ethnos. A racialized populace, population whose political activation is represented by Aureliano and Fisher Credo's pediment. The importance of this hierarchical order is not only instantiated by the Senate's actually higher position within the building, but is emphasized by the Senate Hall's soaring proportions and elaborate decorative program, which I compare in this slide to the relatively modest chambers of the lower house. The Senate Session Hall was conceived as the sanctum sanctorum of a native elite, a cadre of representative men who were to act as the guiding lights for the ethnos. The ornamental program was intended to valorize a restrained and dispassionate intellect, which is articulated not with, a not with a generic racialized ideal, as is the case with the pediment, but rather by portrayals distinguished by their individual character. The room's entire ornamental program was developed and executed by the, at by the atelier of Isabella Tampinco, a master wood carver best known for his intricately carved church ceilings. Because of time, we will limit um, today's discussion to the frieze, which you see here just under this halo of naked incandescent bulbs. The frieze is occupied by an unprecedented gathering of 16 global lawmakers plucked from both modern and ancient history. Presiding over the most symbolically important positions were the figures on the western and eastern walls. On the western wall was Woodrow Wilson, holding a copy of his 14 points, and Pope Leo XIII, who created a new archdiocese in the Philippines in 1903. On the eastern wall facing the senators were two Filipino figures, Apollinario Mabini, the only recently deceased lawyer and revolutionary leader known as the brain of the revolution, and Datu Kalantiao whose legal code dating back to 1433 had recently been discovered and transcribed in a 16th century Spanish manuscript. When the manuscript was first discovered in 1913, historians scrambled to include Kalantiao's legal code in Philippine textbooks. This discovery could not have come at a better time for Filipino nationalists, who often found themselves with no recourse when faced with arguments that legitimize colonial rule by pointing to the indigenes' lack of a verifiable civilizational inheritance. As it would turn out, this cosmic gift from the heavens was too good to be true. In the late 60s, an American PhD student, um, who, they, and they always ruin everything, right? Studying at the University of Santo Tomas, successfully defended a dissertation that argued that Kalantiao and his legal code were pure fabrications, invented in 1912 by a Filipino trickster priest and philological hobbyist named Jose E. Marco, who sold the fake manuscript for a fabulous sum to the Chicago industrialist Edward E. Ayer. The manuscript was until 1960 actually considered one of the crown jewels of the Newberry Library in Chicago. It was a disheartening blow for the Filipino elites desperate to endorse a great civilizational past. But is this fake any different from the manufacture of myth and meaning seen throughout the legislative building? 
Though historians assented to the discovery of Jose Marco's forgery by quietly removing his presence from Philippine textbooks, there's a great deal to learn from Kalantiao. As Akbar Abbas argues, the fake is a symptom that enables us to address, rather than to dismiss, some of the discrepancies of a rapidly developing and seemingly ineluctable global order. Abbas asks us to think of the fake as a social, cultural, and historical response to the processes of globalization and to the uneven and unequal relations that globalization has engendered. In this light, the belief in Kalantiao is symptomatic of a, of a pathology that is the outcome of impossible demands placed on postcolonial nationals who must provide not only proof of their own development, but also of a significant contribution to world history, with an ancient history markedly preferred. Now let us consider the freeze in its totality. Its multiculturalism seems to conform to contemporary calls for inclusiveness. For example, we can easily see these figures as a basis of a survey on the global history of law. This diversity, however, does not come without conditions, one of the most problematic of them being the imposition of a civilizational history as a standard for inclusion. To conclude, we will return to the United States, though I should point out we never really left. The image above is of William Howard Taft in front of, um, oh, sorry, actually, this is the wrong image. Sorry. This, uh, the image above is of William Howard Taft in front of what was his last great accomplishment, a freestanding Supreme Court building, a collaboration with his close friend, the architect Cass Gilbert. Though William Howard Taft is best known for being the fattest president to occupy the office, it is far more remarkable that he is the only president to serve as a chief justice for the US Supreme Court and as the first civil governor general of the Philippines. <clears throat> because of time constraints, my connection here will remain suggestive. Throughout his political career, Taft remained keenly interested in the affairs of the Philippines, especially as it related to architecture, an interest that he developed during his close collaboration with Daniel Burnham. Here, the sculptor Adolf A. Weinman uh, assembles a group of world leaders conspicuously similar to those selected for the, le the Legislative Building Senate Session Hall. Sorry, I don't know if I made it clear. This is the frieze that's on the interior of the, of, um, of the main chamber of the Supreme Court building. Whether or not the influence was direct, and I suspect that it was, the takeaway remains the same. What we are seeing here is an attempt to articulate a relationship of a nation to its political institutions of internationalism, a political reconfiguration that includes, if it does not begin, with the ascent of, formerly colonized, of the formerly colonized to the new structure of empire. To really conclude, my aim uh, tonight has not been to argue for um, this history's inclusion within a global history. Rather, I have attempted to present this history as itself part of a history of inclusivity in order to demonstrate how inclusion, with an asterisk, should also be understood as a part of a history of a colonial violence, or it could be, let's say, captured by, um, uh, uh, by powers that, um, that impose colonial violence. The asterisk appended to this inclusion is one that requires self-thematization as the price of admission. Fanon himself uh, never quite accepted, nor did he ever fully reject his own self-thematization, his triple personhood. The thematization of his body is not what he wanted. He did not want to be an object. In his words, he wanted simply to be a person among other persons. At the same time, he accepted and affirmed his own objectification on an intellectual level because racial inequality persists. There are, Fanon realized, no alternatives to triple personhood. The history that I have presented today, today one of expert mimicry, specious heritage, genius fakes, and master, performance, master performances, resists admission into a historical canon, a carefully confected body that nevertheless both claims and demands authenticity. A better understanding of the world, its requirements, and how we work as architects and historians within it will require not only inclusive histories, but also entirely reconstructed ones. This process of reconstruction will begin with the recognition that all of history, including this one, belongs not to a particular people, but to all of us. Um, Diana, I first want to thank you for an illuminating, engaging, and complex lecture that thinks with legal documents, sculpture, plaques, friezes, pediments, 
buildings themselves, which we see more rarely, plans and paintings about possibly the largest of questions that architecture as a discipline and we as historians confront. That is to think, sit with, and theorize architectural, historian, architectural histories of the racial state, to analyze its present, its past, and to recognize, as you say, that, quote, all of history, including this one, belongs to all of us. Um, in the short formal response, I want to mark that with this lecture, you make a critical argument for me about questions of the canon, taking a decided stance beyond and, in a way, against the framework of adding. Um, rather, you call for a serious interrogation to render legible strategies that mobilize and deploy systems of oppression, including in architectural re registers and in specific, and in the specific context of the racial state. Architecture is not a mirror image or a contingency in this nexus, but central to it. You say that in the larger context of your book, quote, race was the first object of development practice, the tools of which were education and environmental modification in the form of landscape architecture and public works projects, end of quote. Toward the conclusion that we just heard, um, you further explicate this point, arguing that, quote, while native, uh, nativism realized in tectonic forms and expression of poor structures, the formalization of deracinated technological process seem, so I'm stressing, seem to be ideological opposites, uh, but were in fact uh, organs of the same organization and remain so. And the reasons for this seeming opposition is clear. Um, has it been established as the through line in architect writing, for example, in so many texts on tropical architecture? Um, for me, that's one of the many theoretical questions and um, theoretical contributions in your lecture tonight is your insistence, your way of making us see that both of these architectural expressions are two sides of the same coin or organs of the same organization and not ideological opposites. They are, in your words, global, systematization of techniques of racial management and ways to iterize racialization as its fundamental basis from, in this talk, the late 19th century and its analog techniques in the post-war period. Detlef Metten's work was uniquely dedicated to the history and theory of modernity. Your lecture tonight, for me, is a reminder of one of the important points of his modernity unbound, that is, in so many ways that your work theorizes and historicizes the need to document not only how, and now I'm quoting Martins, the monolithic construct of modern architecture and how it began to crack, but to produce the historiographic work to untangle histories of modernity while highlighting how much there's still to do for architectural historians. Staying with Martins, I want to thank you for a lecture that and again, I'm quoting, open up material we thought we knew. It would be impossible for me to think of the US Capitol, for example, without thinking of the Philippines now. And I think that it's, it's really important. And you've insisted to me that this is a US history. And, and I, I really understand how you're um, kind of plotting this for us. And um, that familiarizes us with works and figures that will, will be, that at least I have um, so far not come to know. In doing so, um, and at the same time, you've also shown that it is necessary to, quote, keep the material open rather than closing it down once more. So to get our conversation started for tonight, I want to pose three questions, and then we'll field um, questions from the audience one by one. Um, <clears throat> The first concerns the longer arc of your book, and I thought maybe we can actually do it in reverse. I'll maybe ask the as first question, maybe the last question that we might discuss. So the first concerns, concerns the longer arc of the book and to place the history of racialization you've laid out tonight in conversation with the histories of global development you cite uh, towards the end in the post-war period. 
I'm also interested here in how histories of militarization in the Philippines that continue um, actual hard-fought rebellions that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk, the violent quashing of them by the American government, first in 1898, square with the history you've, you've narrated, um, and also um, with continued and tacit forms and active forms of violence that your book overall covers. My second question um, is a fact that you noted in one of our previous conversations, and I hope it's okay um, I share this with um, the larger group. Those are, um, and maybe this will bring us elsewhere, but I thought to put it on the table, the co-constituent histories of US settler colonial violence and colonial violence in um, the architectural and political personnel that you found to be linked through um, strategies and spatial histories and spatial technologies. And then finally, I'm also wondering if diasporic histories and methodologies, and you, you also flagged those in the beginning, resistant histories maybe, um, were and are and have been useful to you in thinking with politics of language and visuality you encounter, the fact that there are um, Today, between 100 and 200 languages commonly spoken in the Philippines, um, and that life and culture created on more than 7,000 islands. I also have a question, what that means for your research. Um, I found the moment, the plaque that you started with, incredibly important as a technique of resistance from the plaque to the trick. Um, and so, in addition to careful wordsmithing and um, these type of trickster moves, are there other instances you've come across um, that push back openly um, against colonial, the colonial state, questioning its very foundations in small acts and actions, including maybe repair, stewardship, maintenance of cultural, and even maybe environmental practices or assertion of language? Um, thank you so much, Diana, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I think I might, I, I might start with uh, sort of um, the response uh, the, the, to the last question about um, uh, other pushback to, I mean, and, and it, I, as I suggested, the, the, the resistance to um, first uh, to, to Spanish and then American and then to uh, colonialism and then to Philippine national hegemony um, is never extinguished. And um, this is um, particularly pronounced with indigenous communities and with the Moro, um, and with the Moro communities uh, sort of historically in the Philippine South. Um, I, obviously that hasn't been my focus today, but I, I mean, a lot of people are doing this work, actually Will Davis up there. <laughs> He's um, looking at especially indigenous communities who are resisting the construction of dams, which are um, sort of, uh, sponsored at first by um, the World Bank and the IMF and, and now sponsored by Korean and Chinese um, uh, development agencies, um, sort of modeled after um, uh, the IMF in many ways. And so, um, so yes, I mean, um, this is uh, something that I'm both interested in um, but, uh, and, um, and care about but is not necessarily the focus of my, of my own scholarship but it is important to note that it is, that that it, that in fact, like that resistance, is always there. And I think in my own work, I, I I think I am, you know, actually as I just got my reader responses back, you know, trying to rebalance the archive, right? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, like to make sure that that no no work should actually um, be without that um, without that um, view sort of robustly represented. And so um, so that is. Um, 
I guess, the, the direction of, of, of my edits. <laughs> um, the first um, question, I, I, my pen ran out of ink just as I was trying to record your second question. So, um, but you had a question about militarization. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, it, that of course is like a, a really interesting question right now. I mean, the Philippines was always um, uh, of interest to the United States, mostly as a strategic position. Um, uh, both in terms of um, its uh, uh, providing access to um, uh, a historically reticent Chinese, um, Chinese market, and also as a militarily important um, uh, strategic point. Um, and we see that now, of course, because um, the United States has just announced, and the Philippines has announced its um, sort of welcome of the construction of new military bases in the Philippines in, um, in relation to the, um, the current threat of, um, of a Chinese takeover, takeover of Taiwan. And so this, um, this is a history that's ongoing. And, um, and yeah, and, and so um, that actually, the, one of the last chapters in my book is dedicated to, um, to this particular aspect of, um, of uh, sort of colonial history because it is one of the most persistent, um, especially if we're talking about architecture and the built environment. actually worked in a settler colonial context in the United States. So I was wondering if there was anything you wanted, like if you wanted to talk about this. Yes, I mean, uh, the, so it's, very, it's in very early stages and I think Manuel might be, might be watching right now. So if you are, hi Manuel. So um, Manuel and I are actually, um, he gave a talk at MIT and I just happened to notice like in a couple of his, um, a couple of his captions, I was like, oh, what is that figure doing there? His, like a couple figures that overlapped in our archives. He, if Manuel Schwarzberg works, works on the Cahuilla Indians, and um, David Barrows um, is the main figure who, who we're looking at and collaborating on a piece right now. And um, he sort of got his um, degree at University of Chicago in anthropology, studying um, the, um, the, he wrote the first ethnobotany of the Cahuilla Indians. And he ended up being, um, uh, he ended up holding several different colonial offices um, in the Philippines. And sort of the transfer of that knowledge from, um, from California to, um, to the Philippines is, is something that is of a particular interest to us. I mean, one of, I, I mean, in terms of an architecture history, what's really totally fascinating, what, which has fascinated us is the fact that, I mean, not, there's this sort of not very well known um, uh, magazine called The Craftsman that was published out of California, sort of coming out of William Moore, uh, coming out of Arts and Crafts. Um, the first article was, um, a republication of, um, I think, News From Nowhere, and um, by William Morris, of course, and um, this was a California publication in the Philippines, like actually the Department of Education actually published, um, you know, as a part of the colonial project, um, a magazine called The Philippine Craftsman, which was, based, was, which was directly um, modeled after the California Craftsman. And so on an, on an aesthetic register, um, this was um, something that, uh, a sort of knowledge transference that was, that was being developed. Sorry for giving it away, Manuel. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I think we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, uh, Lucia. Thank you. I can revise my terminology. It was brilliant, um, and especially a very tight sort of holding together of uh, sort of repertoire of post-colonial critique with, you know, architectural history as a planning, uh, you know, history, and also iconography, all of this reading of friezes. So sort of classicism is back, of course, not really back, but yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm very interested in this critique that you're making of the, of the usual distinction between post-war internationalism and pre-war um, internationalism. And um, again, I applaud your drawing on these, uh, you know, post-colonial theorist Fanon, who's drawing from his experience with the French uh, empire, and you have Akbar Abbas, who's drawing from the British, and then you have some Spanish stuff, but I wonder if we couldn't actually think of the US uh, as a 
counterexample. Woodrow Wilson never joined the League of Nations. As you know, it was his idea, and then he didn't join. And so maybe you're... Well, uh, he, so, he wanted to, but the U.S. wouldn't, wouldn't assent to it. I mean, right, so yeah. the, the U.S. was able to benefit from this interwar internationalism, which wasn't institutionalized. You could get German sculptors and French-trained, you know, whatever. The softer internationalism was more part of it. And so therefore, the image that I have of your bureaucrats training the, the you know the bureaucrats are leaving behind is one where you're forcing them to do something else. It's not recognition, it's not Fanon, it's not quite Agbas. It's the kind of forcing that you do when you force someone to look at iconography. <laughs> like you force people to look at sculpture. That's very, very different. So it's a slightly different picture than what you're saying where there's simultaneously decorative, decorative uh, racialized classicism and stripped Swiss classicism. It's not quite that. It's true, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, and I found myself, you know, I just spent a lot of time with those pediments, and I, you know, and, and, and just had to think about them. I didn't, you know, I didn't have a sort of methodological approach that I, like, uh, like a pre-digested methodological approach that I brought to it. But it's true in the sense that I, I, like, that was slowly revealed to me, that this was essentially an exercise in soft power that was um, a sort of... A, specifically and, and so carefully calibrated as, um, um, you know, as an aesthetic practice. And so, yeah, and I, and I, you know, I thank you for that because, I, you know, it is, let's say, um, not, you know, maybe I need to do a deeper dive into other, into other sort of parallel instances of this happening in other post-colonial nations, but I don't know that it exists to this level. I mean, I just, and so I think, it is interesting that, um, yeah, and, and, and to, um, you know, one of, my, one of my problems that I keep reaffirming is U.S. exceptionalism, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, uh, and on the one hand, I keep wanting to disavow it, right, but then on the other hand, I'm like, oh my gosh, this didn't happen anywhere else, you know, and I'm just like, okay, I just have to accept it. Exactly. Exactly. That and that is okay. That is that's good. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Imperialism. Oh my God. I think we had another question up here and in the queue. Oh, I got. Uh, it works now. <laughs> I have five pens now. <laughs> oh, did you uh, hi, Diana. Thanks for a fantastic lecture. Um, I have a question about your reading of the building itself. Um, that in a way maybe follows on Lucia's question about what we could call kind of different flavors of neoclassicism. Um, and obviously your reading of the building through the body, both in terms of the subjectivity of the architect and the program of the frieze, totally convincing. Um, but at the same time, that slide you have of the legislative building in the League of Nations is really intriguing because there is such a contrast. And so I'm just wondering if there's something slightly zoomed out kind of at the level of style or language that could be valuable to you because to me that difference suggests sort of two questions. One is how the building would have been received. You At some point you said sort of, um, you know, a direct quotation of monumental Washington and I'm curious if that's, you know, it's not the kind of rationalist federal neoclassicism which, you know, it, and it's it's quite Baroque, right? It's, it was interesting to see the, the Trevi Fountain thing. Um, and then the, the other question, just very quickly, is if that f intriguing fork in the road you posit is quite so simple or maybe limited to the question of the body or not the body? Um, because of course it seems like there's also a kind of temporal access, right? Like leaving behind the body is also trying to leave behind history and modernism, which does not make it progressive or <laughs> any less imperialist, but is maybe something to consider. And then also just the whole question of ornament. Um, it's not just the sculptures, it's you know the capitals, et cetera. And ornament itself, of course, is, is deeply racialized at this point. So that, that could be interesting. Anyway, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about that question of style. Thank you. Well, that's a lot of questions, Julian. <laughs> um, I, yeah, actually, the, the chapter before this focuses on um, non-figural ornament, actually, um, because, um, interestingly, Ralph Harrington Doan, who was the last American architect to work in the Philippines, did not include any Filipino figures in any of his architecture. Um, and so he was sort of left with... Um, the capitals, the acroteria, like all of these sort of um, elements of, of um, neoclassical architecture to, um, 
to essentially um, attempt to articulate a tropical neoclassicism, and so, and which was of course deeply racialized, and so, um, but not as explicit as the bodies. And um, I think yes, different flavors of okay, it's not it's not strictly sort of a federal neocolonialism. Yes, but why we're splitting hairs here, Julian? <laughs> It, yeah, I, I could come up with like some kind of kind of answer to that, but I feel like it would be disingenuous. <laughs> I think there was a question in the in the front. Karen, I think you had had your hands up. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Karen. What a great talk. Um, it worked. It worked. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. Um, I thought it was a fantastic talk, and I just really loved it. Um, I, I was interested in sort of um, what you do with Philippine collaboration um, and collaborationist politics, um, where illustrados, I mean, and by the 30s, that's not even necessarily a word that folks would use, um, are actually quite supportive of an American colonial project and, and adopt much of it as their own. Yeah. And so, so how does that... Um, and, and that's something that's just always true, even from the beginning of the, of the Philippine-American War. And so I'm just wondering how that, um, how, I didn't hear a lot about that, and I'm wondering how it shaped your analysis. Yeah, I mean, um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I could have been more explicit about that, but yes, that this, that there was this moment where I talked about how, um, under the Republicans, it seemed oppositional. But in fact, this began as a collaboration with Wilson. But that almost sets up a false opposition. In fact, there was collaboration with the Republicans as well. There were different sort of models of colonial governance that the Democrats and the Republicans were trying to develop. And so collaboration, so collaboration didn't look the same or have the same ambit. But um, absolutely, especially the native elite, and I want to make that clear that, that this is what it's representing, not, uh, not in a subaltern population or the Moros or any other group who remained in opposition to U.S. imperialism. But, um, but uh, as far as the mostly Tagalog native elite, there was a, yes, absolutely, in every corner, a sort of collaborationist enterprise. And so, and it and it benefited them, right? Uh, as the the sort of new um, the the new national hegemonic power. Yes, Mark. That was br brilliant, absolutely brilliant from beginning to end. So I just lower the tone with a sort of Neanderthal thing. But the the it struck me that the. the the pediment is not very legible, right? You, can't, no, you can almost not, not see it. So I was interested yeah. in your reflections on that, and 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 I started to imagine, well, if it was meant to be seen from the United States, that would be more of a kind of a horizontal view, and so you could see it. But but I noticed your analysis was re you, re you had this kind of spectacular, sort of flat on, and so for example, when you read when you described that the figures were slightly clumsy, then I thought, well, it might depend, you know, where yeah, you're looking from. Yeah, on the perspective. But yeah. my, the, but the question is something a little bit. I mean, I think one could pursue that a little bit more because it's a sort of the you're, you're analyzing bodies, and if if you think of the the body of the spectator, would it be right to say that the sort of triumphal entry is associated with the lower house, and the pediment is associated with the upper house, and so therefore the sort of in a way lack of legibility it, it somehow relates to a kind of um, elitism in the in the most direct sense, like up. Up in the air is this higher resolution, racial resolution, as you portray it, right? And down below, it's sort of fun and games, more sexualized, more it's a fountain-like, you know. So it's sort of it, you know Disney. It's sort of Disney at the be and and that's kind of at the level of stairs, public. You showed this beautiful image of a real, a real crowd around that, whereas one imagines, I suppose, that the in the in the upper house, there's a gallery, but even access to that gallery would be highly limited. So I just, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to think, like, I suppose the question would be, who, who's the audience for the, for the decorative regime? Yeah. Uh, which you read, like, with a precision that was, I think, just exhilarating. 
Um, so actually, I did. It, it's interesting, and that's part of what I edited out. The fact, the fact that the pediment actually would only be visible from a from a very significant distance, um, and uh, as you can see from the original design of the library, like there was no, almost no there was no attention paid to the pediment, and that is because it would have been invisible, almost invisible to the audience. And I feel like. Um, I don't have an, a straightforward answer for that, except to say that there was this need to fill every single corner of this building with some sort of symbolic meaning. And despite the fact that it wasn't visible, you know, that, um, that there was, yeah, there was just still this compulsion, um, or, or very visible. Um, and so, because I've, I've tried to contend with that, like even in the photographs, it's very, the only way you got that image straight on was a, it's a drone. That's like the first, um, uh, and so um, that's like the first time it's been photographed that way. And so, um, and before that, you just have these incredibly awkward images of it. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I've fully contended with that yet, but I mean, I think, was there a connection, was there this idea that the Senate was supposed to respond to the pediment? I don't think so. Like, because I think, um, I, it would have been very hard, I feel like, to maintain, I mean, I can't say this for sure, but it would have been hard to maintain that connection when you're in the interior. I mean, I guess where where you sit in the interior, maybe there's like some, some sense of that. I, I do really feel like the audience, despite the awkwardness of the, of the perspective, I do feel like the audience for um, the pediment is the ethnos versus the the interior, which was really this sort of this body of representative men. Um, as everyone said, just the way you have uh, traversed through the micro to the macro and back again is really magnificent. Um, I, I want to go to the middle um, uh, um, because I think um, I have I have sort of a two part question. One is, um, what happened to the organization of that interior when you go from the library, which is again supposed to represent a certain national identity, to the legislature, and what happens when that? It, what kind of reorganization when it was that American architect versus a Filipino architect? And then I'm going to make a jump to your uh, wonderful piece in architecture and development to the, you know, because you made the, the League of Nations modernism. Then now you, in that piece, you talk about the corporate modernism of the Rice Institute versus the regionalist uh, national, but both are national institutes of the coconut. <laughs> the incredible coconut story. Yes. Um, so that's a leap between, you know, that's so, so just a comparison first between the library to the legislator, and then is there anything you want to say about the way in which the administ administrative, those are all administrative institutes, the library, the legislature, the, scientific, the uh, rice, uh, uh, um, coconuts. Yeah, um, about the role that the these, um, institutions play within, um, yeah, there are, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, one of the, it's incredibly convenient to use these examples, right? I mean, because they are, they, they present themselves as symbols and, um, and, uh, have an explicitly, um, sort of ideological, amb uh, like desire to express an ideological point. And so I, I mean, I think, you know, maybe I should choose some, I, I mean, I really am just a one trick pony. So I like really have to, uh, I really have to fi figure out like some other things to think about besides um, the architecture of these institutions. But it is, but it's true. I mean, I, I um, they, they, they present themselves as, as incredibly, I mean, I, I mean, they're a gift to historians in the sense that we are, um, that, uh, it's interesting that even though that the, this is sort of these are sort of explicitly made arguments that they still manage to elude architecture history, and um, so um, so yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just I'm just here writing it down. 
for another question. Sorry. Um, while we wait for another question from the audience, I did have a question for you that maybe may, may, might be moot in terms of the question of visibility. But when we're, you were presenting today, I also started to think about racialized notions of gender in the pediment and how the composition also seems to suggest a path, like merely in directionality, maybe of um, basically how this process of quote unquote development will unfold. So by that I mean, on one hand, I was starting to think that um, I had a question around family maybe at the center, um, like nation as family. And then on the other hand, also the really violent um, gender language that we see displayed both in through your narrative about people and in the sculptures that are portrayed in the pediment. So I'm thinking especially of effeminacy, for example. Um, yeah. So. yeah. I, yeah, I think the nation is family is a really interesting one, and it, and it actually is invoked by so many different parties. Woodrow Wilson, uh, famously, the family of like, the League of Nations is based on this idea of a family of nations. But I think the notion of family is interesting uh, in the, the, like there is this sort of um, variety of sexual tensions that are, are pre that, um, and, and tensions between gender are present in the, um, in the pediment. Um, a, a sort of um, intent to suppress a sort of, um, you know, with the sort of aggression of um, the more of Mindanao, it's very important that he's turning away from the female figures. Um, and, uh, you know, this is me reading a little more deeply into it. And, and then, um, but also, um, you know, that there's a sort of, um, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of deference of, of the Visayan figure. I mean, I think all of this is, um, uh, weirdly tied to, I don't know if this is so much tied to family, um, but it's a weirdly, um, they, they're they trying to represent a sort of reproduction of the nation yeah. mm -hmm. without suggesting mm -hmm. that, that, ha that that happens with any sort of act of, re that, that <laughs> any sort of act that reproduction requires. Um, and um, and, and that, that the sort of mores of like, uh, decency or just, um, yeah, uh, an attempt to, um, yeah, uh, sort of desexualize. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was very, on the question of gender, I was very struck by the fact that the three figures in the center of the pediments were mm -hmm. almost non-gendered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the ones on the sides, the Western figures, uh, follow the Renaissance convention of yeah. the, you know, female body modeled really out like a male body and nude and also very peculiar. And yeah, I think there's something really peculiar going on there that you could actually. I I write about this um, in the book. It was edited out out of here. It's it's strange that there are these like sort of conventions of modesty applied to the women in the center, but Per classical convention, the women and men on the on the exterior are nude. And also, uh, uh, female art techniques. Yes, and yeah, it's sort of extremely muscled, and um, and so, yeah, I I don't know that I actually thought of the musculature as much as I thought about the lack of clothing. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, but but it is. Profoundly strange. I mean, I think it's something I, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that can definitely be, yeah, that I have to think about more. Oh, yes, yeah, no, we, we yeah, I, 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 I bear the burden of, of that history every day. <laughs> Diana, thank you so much for this talk. I okay. I'm so struck by your comment that um, this episode resists, you know, sort of being admission into the canon, and um, it, it, in that sense, this text, this billing, kind of enacts that. If if one can say triple bind that the 
you know, other, the subject is in, which is that, which is that it, it's just never enough. It's never authentic enough. It's never canonical. And it's just never. And so then by doing this work of writing this history kind of, so one is the story you tell about how this is enacting a kind of disciplinary violence, you know, in terms of the field of architecture and architects being trained. And, and, and I was so struck by the fact that uh, Arellano, Arellano, oh gosh, Arellano, yeah. Are, Arellano. I can't. I, Sorry. <laughs> um, is a colorist, and then there's those images of uh, colorized images of uh, the, from the National Geographic, and what is this work of like huh. represent? Yeah, this That's just, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just throwing it out there. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so there's a kind of disciplinary violence enacted by this work of producing this architect. But then by recounting the story, I imagine that you are also enacting a kind of disciplinary violence, but in the field of architectural history. And I want to know more about that. I want to know about how you think about this you know, telling a story that resists being told in any kind of um, I mean, the thing norm. is, I, I think one of the things I was thinking about is like, how could this possibly fit in within a canon? It's like full of, it's full of disingenuousness and, and fakes and it's like this, it's this idea of, um, of, of total fabrication. And, um, and uh, you know, and it's, uh, and this is something I'm really interested in. Like, um, but one that, I, I mean, I, I don't actually find it hard to imagine a class, for example, taught by color, <laughs> um, that where you would have a, a class, like, w that would introduce the problem of fakes in architecture. I mean, I, I don't think it could ever be a canonical, um, it could ever stand as a canonical, um, figure within architecture history though. And, and, and in a sense like that, that is, um, yeah, I mean, in a sense that is the sort of disciplinary violence that I guess I intend to do, right? I mean, I say this, you know, I say this with deep amb ambivalence because I teach an architecture history survey and I, I've, I've like resolved to come from the position of love, like, because like, that's the only way the students will, will, will take it. Um, and, uh, but, but I think, um, so, trying to understand the relationship of this research work to, um, to, uh, to teaching is, is one I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm constantly trying to contend with, but yeah, I have to figure that out. I have to figure out what the consequences are to, to, to the discipline and, and what, I, what I want that to be, but I don't know. Isn't attempting to just try reversing the argument, right? That the canon is the sort of preeminent zone of the fake. Mm. It's true. Right? <laughs> right. If you think, I mean, just start with um, authorship, the, the gendering of authorship. So, it's it's the rendering of mastery to 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 a kind of fictitious figure who wasn't in fact involved in the production, right? So, that would be one line. Another line would be. There are no straight lines in the Parthenon, so is, is that a, is its canonical status the precision of its fakery, right? That, the next one would be, well, anyway, what about those columns pretending to be trees? Like, in other words, so we would have to do a kind of typo a kind of um, typology of fakery, and then position your fake in the middle middle of it. So the, it might not be, it can't get into the canon because it's not a fake. But it might be, it's a particular you know, kind of fake. Yeah, and, no. And, and taking it one step further, that fakeness wouldn't be, as it were, in the object, but in its reception, history, and transformation, and so on. I think one of the, the beautiful qualities, if I understood you right about the argument, that when, when the fake was exposed as a fake, it didn't seem to lose its authority. Maybe for the museum in the States was a bit of a problem, but it, it can, it, in, a way, in a way, the aura was magnified, right? So I'm just, I'm just saying. It, so, in, in terms of your general claim, I, it couldn't get in, couldn't get in. May, maybe it kind of gets in really fast. Yeah, actually, there, there's an interesting story about Kalantiao. So I did say, and I had to eliminate so many things for brevity. Like I, I did say that um, historians quietly removed. <laughs> 
Klan Tiao from history textbooks, but that's not actually completely true. He remained in several Philippine textbooks, and in fact, Marcos, who was after the discovery of um, Klan Tiao's fakery, um, uh, um, actually introduces a Klan Tiao medal um, for, um, for uh, sort of national accomplishments. And so um, this is, uh, so <laughs> it's this profoundly weird um, uh, moment and revealing moment. Yeah, I mean, the, the I, I mean, it somehow has not, did not lose its aura. I find that really confusing. Um, but, um, but yeah, that maybe it's even, maybe it even, like, yeah, maybe it even exaggerated it. Yes. Yes, okay, sorry. Yeah, of course, Lucia. <laughs> um, I was just, it's a kind of side question, but um, I think the answer is that the canon evolves or develops. And so that New York Times uh, um, headline you had, it was so polite and so politically correct already. <laughs> Whatever it was, it was like, 1927, uh, accomplished Filipino architect was once, quote unquote, on display. You know, it was so, so can you talk about that a little bit? That the just the already, uh, you know, the US is so quick and the press, the liberal press is already so quick to, to be inclusive, to be inclusive exactly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can address that I'm like, I guess maybe just uh, to make it easier for you, like, <laughs> yes. you know, not highfalutin academic discourse or political discourse, but just like popular culture, cultural discourse where these perceptions are kind of consumed. It's so, it's, it's totally, I, I mean, because it's St. Louis, there was, um, I, you know, the New York Times would have been exceptional in this regard. I mean, I think I should have included other sort of, um, you know, I, I, the New York Times article was still problematic, but a lot of articles published in St. Louis at the time and in California where the Igorots moved after, they, they, actually, they actually were paid sideshows, like um, after the St. Louis Fair, specifically the Igorots. Um, and uh, where they traveled, um, you know, the press followed and there was, a far less polite treatment of them in the popular press. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think in that, in that regard, this is the New York Times piece was. Well, yeah, that, that was the thing is like, the, the consumption of dogs was like a sort of ritual. Um, that was the thing in St. Louis that they, it was actual, actually like a ritual practice, but then they were made to do it every day, like twice a day, and for the perform, and performing that for, for, um, for others. And so, um, you know, and the, it's, there are many histories uh, um, that include um, the sort of actual perspective of the people who were placed on display, and, and those are actually very interesting. Um, and actually, artists have looked at generations of the people afterwards placed on display and um, seen what happened to them because most of them stayed in the United States. And um, so it's, yeah. Um, but to answer your question, a variety of responses. Diana, maybe one last uh, um, comment. Um, just as I was thinking about Atiyah's comment of that it's never enough and you reminding us to really take seriously what it means, um, what a fake means um, in kind of responding to um, international and really global impossibilities and pressures. I do wonder um, if aside from taking that seriously, um, just maybe to mark that it's also a really creative act to imagine a legal framework um, and a past legal framework and to imagine into the void. So, um, or to imagine the, I guess, the impossible. So I, I just wanted to say that because um, not, not, all, not all fakes are creative, I guess. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Diana.